So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. It's great that you're joining the third day of JROS and also this session on sustaining open through collaborative funding. Um, actually, the credit goes to uh, Kevin Stranach from PKP, who actually submitted the proposal and I'm helping out with the introduction. And I'll also tell you a little bit about um, SCOS. But before I get into that, um, I think what's really important for us at Spark Europe, and I think in the open science community, is that we have an equitable and inclusive research culture, which Janetta Jones from uh, Canada as a funder uh, underlined yesterday. Um, so, and it's essential that we as a community help ensure the financial uh, stability of key not-for-profit infrastructure. So many of us have come to depend on some of those and also look to some of them to innovate the current scholarly communication system. So we can help them remain independent and community governed, which is really absolutely crucial, remaining close to our uh, research values with the help of the crowd. In small ways, contributing funding to help sustain open science infrastructure. So today we've got some important infrastructures here today talking about what they do and how they fund their work. Um, and they're also talking about how they're working together to build a more sustainable path going forward. So we'll be talking about the SCOS model. I will uh, tell you about it if you don't already know it. Um, it's one way to fund established not-for-profit open science infrastructure. It's tried and tested, it's, it's been going for three years now, and the whole open science community has helped raise 3.5 million US dollars. So we're really thrilled with that result. But it still needs to continue, um, that funding. Um, and it's also a concrete funding framework for those who strategically want to invest in open science infrastructures based on trust. So let me just um, also introduce our panel today. So we have um, Kevin uh, Stranach, who I mentioned, he's a membership development and uh, community education coordinator from PKP. We have Ilko Ferverde, who's the director still of the OAPEN Foundation and directory of open access books. Uh, we've got Silvio Peroni, who's the co-founder and director of Open Citations. And I'm helping out with uh, some of the moderation today. I'm the SCOS Executive Group Chair and Director of Spark Europe. So SCOS, um, it stands for the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, and you can find out more from those links. So what's the core challenge? Um, what's the problem that's, that uh, uh, SCOS is trying to solve? So we've seen a huge expanse of open access and open science infrastructure and services developed over the years and often in the nonprofit space, starting at universities, and many of you are doing the same, are startups yourselves, projects. Um, but some of those uh, have actually um, established themselves as quite mature services over time. There are a lot more demands on those services and maybe some of the business models that have been working for them uh, for a few years, they're maybe not working so well and they're looking for other uh, ways to fund uh, themselves in the following uh, few years. We also find that talking to funders and looking at funders, we had a funder session yesterday, funders are really great at funding innovation, uh, but what about the services that, that, that we depend upon and the operations. So who, um, to ensure that those uh, services remain free, there are costs, operational costs for those. So how can we as a community make sure that um, we don't neglect them and we look after uh, them? Um, and of course the risk that if we don't do that, uh, the services may stagnate, downsize or even turn turn up behind paywalls, which I think is not what we're uh, aiming for. Um, so we want to help sustain the infrastructure that supports the implementation of open science and it's particularly focused on not-for-profit. So SCOS was established in early 2017 and the purpose is to provide a new coordinated cost-sharing framework 
that enables uh, uh, the community to support uh, some of those services. So the members uh, behind SCOS who are basically, who vet certain services and recommend them for funding to the community, they come very much from the international library community or the infrastructure community. So from uh, uh, Latin America, we've got Readily, we have the Council of Australian University Librarians, ARL, uh, uh, Spark Europe uh, and others. So we're community led and gov governed, we're a consolidated voice that vets certain infrastructure before recommending it for funding. Um, and so we assess the funding needs, um, alert those funding needs to the community. And we also ask for quite a lot of uh, uh, information on costs. Um, and that also kind of helps save you time on, if you want to invest in infrastructure, um, we can help, uh, help you make those choices more easily. And we also, what's really important is that community governance is really crucial. Just want to also point out that SCOS uh, doesn't collect any funds. The relationship is between the pledger and the infrastructure. So to date, I think I mentioned in my intro, 3.5 million uh, US dollars has been raised by 258 institutions from 19 countries so far. So DOAJ was uh, uh, in the first uh, round and they have exceeded their target. We're absolutely thrilled by that. Sherpa Romeo is still at 42%, so they are still really uh, in need of community funding. Um, and then we have uh, the four services with us today who are also raising funds for the next few years with your help. Uh, just to give you an idea of what kind of targets we're looking at, you can have a look on the right hand side. Uh, these are operational funding targets for the, the services and infrastructures here, and you can also see where they are on reaching those targets. So I'm uh, now going to pass you on to uh, the three or actually four services to just tell us very briefly about themselves, what they're doing, um, what their aims are, and then I shall quiz them a bit and hopefully you will as well. So over to you, Elko. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, I'll talk about OAPED and DOAB, giving you a quick idea of what they do <laughs> and, and how they are currently doing. Uh, Scott selected OAPEN and uh, DOAB together, which is perhaps less strange than it seems as they are closely connected and OAPEN actually launched DOAB in 2013. Both platforms are dedicated to open access to, to academic books, both enable seamless access to open access books, both check peer review procedures and make these publicly available. Both are community-based and non-profit foundations and both are migrating to open source platforms. Um, next, please. OAPEN launched as a library for open access books in 2010, which is 10 years ago uh, last October. It was developed with support from the uh, European Commission with uh, six university presses and two universities. And this is why the OAPEN platform is set up as a repository based on library and repository standards, which is how it still works today. OAPEN hosts full text, freely available academic books. We work with publishers and funders to aggregate the books and make them available as a quality controlled collection to researchers, but also to libraries and discovery services. We take care to collect, improve and add metadata and make the metadata available in various formats for harvesting and downloads. OAPEN launched DOAB, as I said, in 2013 following the example of DOAJ and with help from Lars Björnshauger. The idea was that DOAB as a free and separate discovery service would be able to follow in the footsteps of DOAJ and make OA books global, globally available. DOAB aims to provide a reliable source for OA books metadata, making it easy to find OA books and easy to integrate OA books in library catalogs. Um, next, please. DOAB uh, fulfilled its promise to become a global resource for OA books. Uh, it is now developing into a central hub with metadata being uploaded by publishers and various aggregators, not only OAPEN, but also, for instance, Open Edition and Project News. 
The OAB is now approaching 35,000 books for more than 400 publishers. OAPEN, on the other hand, is a full text collection with added services such as deposit, preservation, annotation, visibility, usage reporting, and dissemination. It currently has about 14,000 OA books and chapters. And uh, with that, OAPEN is among the largest OA collections of academic books, serving between three and four million downloads annually. Next, please. As DOAB develops into a global service, it must recognize the diversity in publishing practices around the world. And this has come to be known as bibliodiversity. It connects with the effort of quality assurance, which is essential to achieve trust. And without trust, this service can't exist. In the last few years, most of what we've done has to do with these elements of bibliodiversity, quality assurance, and trust. We felt that um, DOAB should become independent of OAPEN and um, have its own governance structure. This is why OAPEN and Open Edition started talking about a partnership. And last year, we finalized the governance for DOAB. It's now an independent foundation based in the Netherlands and jointly governed by Open Edition and OAPEN. And as a foundation, DOAB isn't owned, there are no shares, and it is governed according to its bylaws. We've been developing a certification service for peer review practices to extend and improve quality assurance and improve transparency in collaboration with Opera. And currently we're migrating our service to an open source platform, and we hope to launch um, next year uh, towards the end of February. Next, please. DOAB and OAPEN rely on community support to sustain their services. There are essentially three options. OAPEN is offering library membership either directly or through Knowledge Unlatched. DOAB also offers library memberships and has a sponsorship option. And both infrastructures can jointly be supported through the SCOS funding scheme. Um, I'll end my presentation of DOAB and OAPEN here, except to mention that we launched a new resource last month. Next, please. Uh, this is the uh, OAPEN Open Access Books Toolkit, <coughs> which is a free resource to help authors better understand OA book publishers, publishing and uh, to help them in the process of publishing their manuscript in open access. We hope this will also become useful as a resource for libraries and research support as they help students and researchers. With that, I'll hand over to Silvio Peroni, who will talk about Open Citations, one of the other infrastructures that is being recommended for funding by SCOS. Thank you, Elko, for, for the introduction. Um, next slide, please. So um, what is Open Citation? So Open Citation that I'm honored to direct with David Shutton has been established as an open infrastructure, which goal is to provide access to global scholarly bibliographic and citation data of quality and coverage to rival in principle those from proprietary services such as Web of Science and Scopus. Um, open citation is not for profit. The, is, it is, um, the community actually is actually involved in the direction and the governance of open citation through our international advisory board. And all the services that we, uh, we have and make available are free. Um, currently, we provide data containing more than 700 million citations that the community can use for any purpose. Uh, for instance, this data can be crucial as a vehicle for use in national and international research evaluation exercises to make such activities uh, more transparent or reproducible, at least as compared to other proprietary services. Next, please. Um, as an infrastructure, uh, we are entirely dedicated to open scholarship and uh, to the publication of open bibliographic and citation data. Uh, we provide uh, uh, several things, a data model that uh, we use to describe this data that has been also adopted <coughs> by other projects and services. Uh, uh, several collections uh, containing bibliographic uh, metadata and citation data that we make available in a CC0 by using a CC0 license. Uh, all the software that we develop is entirely open source, 
in order to enable other people to reuse it for any purpose. And we made available a bunch of online services, including REST APIs and data dumps that allow people to access uh, citation data. Uh, next, please. So um, currently, uh, we make available to collection uh, one, uh, the, 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 let's say the first one is the open citation corpus. This is the first collection that we have developed that currently contains uh, 40 million citation links between 7.5 million resources. The other collection, which is the open citation indexes, uh, has been released for the very first time two years ago. And it is uh, currently our main data set that we have and that we provide. And currently it contains more than 759 million citations. Uh, we are also working on setting up a system uh, to enable you to share with us uh, citation and bibliographic metadata uh, that, um, and also we are uh, working for um, releasing a new collection that is the Open Biomedical Citation in Context Corpus that was a project funded by the Wellcome Trust that will contain also in text citation of open access article included in the uh, PubMed open access subset. So we will we'll made available citations uh, as they are actually um, defined in the full text of, of the, these open access articles. And uh, we have all these data can be uh, um, required and um, let's say retrieved by using the APA, API, our REST API, uh, which are available in the links uh, in the table. Vanessa, can you click just uh, another time that there is a table with the links? Thank you. Uh, that, are, that contain the links of our APIs. Uh, of the current data set, and we will add additional uh, uh, links and URL for the APIs for the additional collection that we will add in uh, uh, the next months. Next, please. So currently, by means of the REST API we made available and the dump, there are a bunch of services that uh, are using our data. These are just a kind of selection um, that uses uh, our REST API, such as the Open Access Helper Tool, DBLP, Voss Viewer, all of them are using our REST API to retrieve live data that then uh, are used to present uh, additional bibliographic information uh, of the citing and cited papers, as well as uh, beautiful uh, um, visualization of citation networks. And also there are other tools that actually are using our data as they are in the dump, for instance, uh, just to cite Two of them, lens.org, uh, ingested our data, that, the, the data that are, that are available in the open citation indexes. And very recently, just two days ago, a new uh, tool has been launched, a new service that is called Insightful that make use of the uh, data that we make available uh, for uh, defining citations. Next, please. So very quickly concluding, uh, of course, we are, we are a free service and to be free, of course, uh, we, we have costs that we have to cover, so um, we really much appreciate any pledge that can come from any country in order to support our vision, our, our goal. There are different ways that you can support us. Uh, um, uh, you can apply as a member of Open Citation, so even taking part of the uh, governance of Open Citation, or you can support us. Uh, through financial donation. And that's all for uh, my introduction. I will leave the stage to Kevin right now for PKP. All right. Thanks, Silvio. And thanks, everybody, for coming to the session. It's great to have so many people here. It's, uh, it's just a wonderful event. Uh, next slide, please. So I am from the Public Knowledge Project, and we are um, a nonprofit research and open source development initiative that started oh, over 20 years ago um, at the University of British Columbia here in Canada. Uh, our home today is at Simon Fraser University, also in Canada. Um, and the research division is led from Stanford University, but also um, involves Simon Fraser University. Um, we've got a community governance structure that includes um, our, an international advisory committee and also a, a technical committee that, uh, that we work with as well. Uh, next slide. <laughs> you saw that coming. 
<laughs> so what do we do? Um, we're best known for um, creating and maintaining OJS, Open Journal Systems, um, which is free open source software for journal publishing. Um, but we also do um, other projects. We do Open Monograph Press for book publishing, Open Preprint Systems is our latest, um, OPS. Um, in addition to that, though, we also provide free documentation on using the, the software. Uh, we do free online courses. We provide free technical support for our users. We really believe that um, openness needs to be supported. Um, and we uh, really want, we really appreciate the involvement of our community in developing um, all of these support mechanisms alongside of us. Um, everything is, of course, published under a Creative Commons license and it's freely available to everybody. Um, and the technical support um, that happens is via our community forum where our developers participate, but also the community participates in helping each other. It's also important, I think, to um, emphasize that we also do research um, into issues of sustaining and enhancing open access. Um, our room host, Juan Alperin, um, co-leads our research initiatives along with John Belinsky, um, and that's critical in informing the decisions we make um, around software development. Uh, next slide. Um, a really imp important question to us and one that we ask ourselves regularly is why do we do this and why do we keep doing this? And we're really committed to and have been since way back in 98 to increasing the availability and the accessibility and the quality of open access content. And in addition to that, we are really um, are very interested in helping to expand the diversity of voices and the, the perspectives that are being heard in global scholarly communications. Um, you know, English is the dominant language out there. Anglo-American um, publishing is huge. And we've been trying to play a role in helping um, other perspectives um, join in the conversation. Next slide. So why it matters. So OJS is currently used by over 10,000 journals around the world in over 40 languages. And those 40 language translations only happen, again, because of the community. They, they do those translations and donate them back to us and for everybody who wants to take advantage of that language. Um, we're being used as national portal, uh, publishing portals in a number of countries, um, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, there's more in progress. Uh, we're, very appreciative of the, uh, the uptake of our software to be able to move those kinds of national goals forward. Um, over half of our journals are in the global south. We've got huge communities in Indonesia and in Brazil um, throughout Latin America, um, growing communities in Africa. And this really, as I said in the previous slide, expands that diversity of voices that participate in the scholarly conversation and expands the, the kinds of topics that can be talked about um, in those conversations, the kinds of topics that um, may have more of a local interest um, and uh, facilitate those. Um, we're also the largest platform that's used by journals in the DOAJ. Um, we we're very pleased to see recently that more than 40% of the journals that are indexed in the DOAJ um, use OJS as their publishing platform. And uh, we really have long appreciated the excellent work that the DOAJ does and we're very pleased to see um, the role that PKP is playing in helping to fill that, that index. Next slide. So why do we need your help? I think you've got a sense of this. Um, that first point right there, creating and uh, supporting open content isn't free and we know that and that's why um, this event is getting so much interest, which is great. Um, we really believe that the future of scholarly publishing is open access. Um, but there's different directions that could potentially go. And, and we really want to make sure that that future isn't exclusively controlled by large commercial interests, but community interests are front and center. And we want to play a role in that. Um, and we really um, have come to understand, as many of you do, that sustainable, affordable, community-controlled open access um, requires financial resources behind it to support the open infrastructures that make it possible. And next. So why should you help this, um, you know, being part of PKP, supporting PKP um, provides institutional benefits, um, including participation on our community governance committees. Um, we're developing more member only events um, to bring our community together and provides opportunities as well for people to have direct input on the future of our software releases and where we're going. And the help that we get from institutions really ensures that the free content continues to be available 
that it's locally controlled and nonprofit, and that our software uh, continues to exist. Um, it continues to improve, um, continues to have enhancements, um, continues to innovate, be part of new um, directions in scholarly publishing, uh, things that Juan discovers as part of his research to, to see where the future is, and for us to be part of that future and our community. Um, those 10,000 journals that use our software can be part of that future. Uh, next slide. So yeah, just quickly, um, how you can help us, um, our website, and we really ask that you speak to your local decision makers and let them know um, why this matters and speak to them about um, all of the SCOS projects um, and have a look at all of what, what all of us do um, and uh, hopefully um, put some funding forward to support us. That's my email address. That's the, uh, the SCOS link for becoming a funder. And I'll wrap it up there so that we can have time for some conversation. Question. <laughs> Vanessa, I'll turn it over to you to facilitate that. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so actually, I'm itching to ask uh, the panel some questions about funding it, and as I'm uh, sure the audience is. But before that, are there any questions for clarification on who we have here at the table and what they're doing? I think they've they've done a great job to say what they're doing and why it's important. And um, also, we are mindful that you know the community is quite. Uh, quite broad and not all of you have deep pockets we realize that but if there are any that's why uh, um, these infrastructures were also saying if you have some funding available uh, that you know what to do with it so um, but um, be so before we have the the panel discussion are there any uh, questions for clarification in the in the chat Tom I think is following that is there anything or can I launch in to ask the panel some questions can someone give me a thumbs up? Um, I think there's one question, Vanessa. Yes. Tom, could you, re could you read it out? Uh, I think you're muted, Tom. Sorry, sure. Uh, yeah, the question is from uh, Luke Boruta. Uh, the projects that are currently promoted by SCOS were already well established. That's uh, great. but especially given their uh, limited number of entries each year, how could uh, smaller or newer projects compete with um, uh, well, some of the larger, more established infrastructures? Yes. Well, it's not really, a, yeah, it's not a matter of competing, but I understand. I mean, the thing is we know, so firstly with SCOS, uh, we promote two to three services per year, which is of course minuscule in the whole, um, scheme of things. Oh, there's something. Oh, yes, that's okay. I, I just turned off your screen sharing. That's Evan. okay. That's Sorry. That people can put on the gallery if they want to see it. That's okay. Yeah. That's fine. Um, so, so in the whole scheme of things, so, you know, there are many of you who started projects, are startups, and also are looking to funding. Um, we have started with um, trying to alleviate the pain of certain infrastructure where many of us really depend on that critical infrastructure for our open access or open science services. We don't th want them to go away. We don't want them to turn up behind paywalls. Um, and then we also have, uh, um, so in the case of open citations, they're really innovating in, in, in this space. So <clears throat> at the moment, um, this is our model, but we are looking at our strategy for SCOS because we've been running for three years now. So we are starting next year um, to interview, to look at the current space, um, invest in open, of course, is also looking at how can we fund uh, infrastructure as a whole. Um, so there, there is a huge need to fund. Um, and so SCOS will be looking at this, but invest in open as others will be, yeah. Okay, so can I just, I'm going to, I think, uh, ask some of the, my colleagues now some, a couple of questions, if I may. Um, so the first question is, um, can, you, can you tell uh, us a bit more about how you have uh, been funding your services and infrastructures uh, over the years, and also how SCOS is helping you on that path to sustainability? 
And if you can kind of keep it short and succinct, then I can get some more questions in also from the audience. Thanks very much. Shall I start, Vanessa? Yes, go ahead, Ilko. So uh, as I already mentioned in, in my introduction, OAPEN was developed with support from the European Commission. Uh, after that project, we continued as a, as a platform for um, uh, as a non-profit foundation supported by a number of university libraries in the Netherlands. The goal was to transition from subsidy-based to a service-based operation, uh, which, which we did subsequently in a, in a number of years. And we introduced services for publishers and for funders. And we started building up revenue from both those uh, stakeholder groups. And then a few years ago, we also introduced a library membership program. But in addition, an important part of our funding came from uh, various projects, uh, some of them from the European Commission and others in, in collaboration with, with other partners such as funders in some of uh, some countries in Europe. Now, uh, from, from, from there, SCOS has been really helpful in, um, in the way we were selected as an important infrastructure and, and then uh, promoted to the open science community, recommended for uh, funding to the community. And this now is helping us to, to reach out and gain support uh, from more institutions and their consortia. That is hopefully how we are uh, going to improve our sustainability going forward. Thank you. Kevin so, or Silvio? Yeah, I, I can, I can, I can uh, say that. So we started as a very small infrastructure governed by two people. So David and I for a series of years, I will say. And the main income that we had were from grants we obtained by applying to foundations. Uh, originally, um, David uh, had the grant by a few grants by JISC to develop the first instance of the Open Citation Corpus. And then we were able to get support by the Sloan Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. Um, but of course, this was kind of difficult to, 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 to be sustainable, let's say, in the long term. And SCOS, I think, was, and he's, uh, key to move our expectation into a more shared and community-oriented governance. One of the first things that we have done by, um, because of SCOS was to indeed create an international advisory board to allow the community to, to be involved in the governance of open citations. But in addition to that, uh, SCOS also provided us a lot of um, additional visibility to a broader community. And I really think that without SCOS help, we uh, weren't able to, 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 to reach in just one year all the support that we have received from uh, several institutions uh, and uh, even uh, organization that actually supported us by by providing us um, funds for our operation so without cost that was I think impossible in just a short time uh, similarly for us at PKP um, we've got a few different revenue streams that we've relied on um, as I mentioned in my presentation we we were born as a research project so grants um, have always been important to us. And we've um, um, you know, had so, some very good success with some of the granting agencies over the years that we've very much appreciated. And currently we've got really good support from the Canadian federal government and the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, um, which has been extremely helpful. But we always, you know, grants go up and down. Um, and so you want to have something more sustainable than grants. Um, we developed a a sponsorship program um, where we ask institutions to support us um, and that's had some success particularly in, in Canada and, and some in the United States and a little bit internationally and uh, we also developed um, paid services so of course everything that we do is free and open source but in our in our sort of philosophy of helping openness um, both through documentation and courses and free support. We also um, provide hosting for those that don't have the technical abilities to host themselves um, and we charge back for that. 
And uh, that's been an important part of, um, of our revenue mix. SCOS has been um, amazing for helping us um, grow in a couple of ways. One, um, it's by being sort of reviewed and vetted by SCOS, it's really um, helped get the message out there that PKP is important infrastructure. Um, and it's um, been helping us meet more people and develop more contacts, um, particularly um, beyond the, the stronger contacts that we have in Canada and the US. That's been super important. And the, the goal with the SCOS funding that we raise is also to help professionalize um, and market and increase the reach of our publishing services um, so that uh, the fee-based component of PKP can continue to grow and continue to sustain us. And overall, that's gonna provide a leveling of the, of the revenue that comes into us um, so that we're not stuck on the, the grants coming in, going out, um, but uh, more solid mix of three different sources that will provide us with the long-term sustainability that, that all of us are looking for. Thank you very much. I, I think there are a number of questions in the chat and the time is really running away with us. So I'd like to give room now to the audience to pose their questions or Tom. So either actually, um, please the people who have questions, uh, you can take the microphone and put uh, your cameras on, would be great to see you. Or else if you'd rather one of us read out the questions, please go ahead. Who was first? Don't be shy. Or Tom, do you want to read? Is, is somebody ready to go? Um, I have a simple, or I have a question. Um, yes. As I'm listening to the business models presented here, they seem awfully similar to the cooperative movement, especially platform cooperatives, which are attempting to have infrastructure owned by the community of users where the user community has a democratic vote in the outcome of the, of the institute, you know, of, the, of, the, of the organization that's building it. And I, if that's not, um, I, I just want to bring that attention. There's a lot of movement in the platform cooperative community if you search for platform cooperatives. And um, I think a bridge from this community to that community would be really beneficial, mutually beneficial. Um, just a note, thanks. And Thank I, I could just say that's, yeah, that's an excellent point. And that's the whole, the whole um, philosophy of cooperativism is very important to us. Um, one of the research projects that we recently had was on publishing cooperatives and looking at how the cooperative model can help not just sustain infrastructure, but also more broadly sustain the funding of open access. Um, so it's a great point. We also uh, require, there's a, there's a very extensive application form if you get that far. Um, and as part of that application form, we do uh, require uh, applicants to say, uh, to talk about their governance and international governance, and also how they might be inclusive of those who pledge uh, having a say uh, in the governance. So that it really is community owned. Um, so that, that, that way we also want to uh, uh, stimulate that um, uh, governance is, uh, that, that uh, community governance uh, is followed through uh, when we have that relationship between SCOS and, and those that we promote. Next questions. Shall I read out a question, yes, Vanessa? Do. Yeah. Okay, then I'll begin with the, the first one here from, uh, from Heather. Um, so there are 258 institutions that have um, supported so far through SCOS. Through um, uh, there are two questions here. Has that number been growing over the last uh, three years? And has also the dollar value or the commitment per institution been growing in that same period? So, the, um... So of course, with COVID, this year has been a tough one. So we haven't had as many institutions pledging uh, this year, and we, we are also concerned about next year. However, we have had a very generous contribution of half a million uh, US dollars by the French ministry that has an open science fund, which uh, matches its national policy. So they have looked, uh, they also have a strategy to fund open science infrastructure and they look to SCOS at what we recommend. And so that has helped um, 
some of the infrastructures out this year. Um, I have to say that um, the pledges that we've had from consortia, like from Canada, from Australia, um, for example, uh, they have also followed through um, and pledged, although maybe to lesser extents this year uh, because of COVID, uh, but they are, again, uh, when they pledged for DOAJ and Sherpa Romeo last year or the year before, they're now, uh, many of them, uh, following through uh, and, and supporting infrastructure because it's also a strategy uh, for, for them to support open science infrastructure. Uh, now, the value of the dollar, I'm not sure whether I'm the best one to answer that one, but um, we certainly see challenging times ahead, But and yet... Right now, the need is even greater and the risks are also higher that perhaps some of these infrastructures might get snapped up by the commercial industries. So it would probably be a lot less costly for us if we contributed small amounts for these infrastructures now, because otherwise we might have to create some of these infrastructures ourselves, which is a lot more uh, uh, expensive or, you know, pay as part of a... a a subscription plan for, you know, with a big commercial uh, publisher. Any more questions? Just before you read the next one, just a little seven minute warning before we're back in the main room. Sure. I would love to speak again. Um, for, for funding models for these kinds of institutions, um, rather than thinking of it as a nonprofit, um, you know, rather than having a, a for-profit company take over and, and offer a paywall, um, would you ever consider some of these services actually just being subscription based and, um, you know, at least being a nonprofit democratically controlled, but still, you know, have a paywall um, in order to generate revenue. And that's one part. And part two is, um, are any funding agencies interested or able to do what they call program related investments in, instead of a donation for starting any kind of, you know, uh, more of a democratic cooperative way of organizing these things rather than just strictly nonprofit. Um, Sorry, could you could you repeat the last uh, bit of the question because I was taking notes? Yeah, the, no, the second question is um, um, some nonprofits will or some foundations will allow for what are called program related investments, which are are, you know, you have to pay them back because they're loans. But on the other hand, um, you know, if you if you structure yourself co cooperatively, these may provide startup funds to where the user community could then through subscription fees be able to slowly pay back. And um, for some, um, I don't know if this opens up a new kind of opportunities for some groups that want to be subscription based. I, I think I totally agree that we do not want corporate ownership of these things, but how do we, rather than going all the way to nonprofit, is there a middle ground to where the user community through subscriptions that are reasonable will be able to fund ongoing activities and then use foundations through a program related investment in order to bootstrap those processes? Thanks. So Clark, I think there are some really great ideas in there and, and certainly, so uh, SCOS, we uh, promote infrastructure for three years, um, but we really want uh, this infrastructure to think ahead what happens after those three years and to really explore different types of models. The, the ones that you're already mentioning, we really need to have a multi-pronged approach uh, to find different ways um, uh, 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 of um, bringing in revenues. Um, we also need to talk to, 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 to the large funders, but to, as you say, the institutions, maybe script, subscription models. Um, so um, it is on the institutions. It's not for them to sit back or gather funds now just for the next three years. It's also to work on this uh, more sustainable pathway forward. Yeah. So would love to catch up with you a bit more and perhaps... Uh, have another session with you and 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 the colleagues on the call another time. Thank you. Any more questions? I've got one quick question if you've got time. Yes, please. Um, I really like uh, some of where you're going with that, uh, Clark Evans. Um, and I guess I'm curious, when we talk about commercialization and corporations, we tend to think about the big ones, right? The Barnes and Noble True. education, the, you know, but a lot of adjunct professors actually run a corporation. Right. And there's a lot of small businesses that are lifestyle businesses that still need to tweak out a living in this yeah. in this environment. Right. Um, and so how can we support lifestyle businesses, smaller organizations that want to contribute yet want to have kind of control over what they're developing and how they move forward so that we can build a more of a, a, a market that is diverse and um, 
and, and kind of build to some of those things that you were talking about, uh, Clark, Mr. Evans. Thanks. That's a great point. And at the moment, the strategy is to support not-for-profit, but that might change. And certainly Invest in Open uh, is looking at the, the whole breadth. So uh, I do really think that we need to, uh, to again, um, look at all of the opportunities and, and look at what's best for a sustainable uh, open science infrastructure uh, ecosystem, one that works. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sean. Can I ask a really quick follow-up to that? Yes. So I think that embedded in that were two different questions that are interrelated. One of them was the sort of like for-profit, non-profit distinction, but the other one was the like large, well-established organization versus smaller organization distinction. And, you know, it occurs to me that especially for, for younger nonprofits that are not, you know, well-established two-year-long kind of organizations, they're at a particularly, they're at a particular moment where they might be influenced in one direction or another of like how they create their sustainability model, their business model, whatever. And in the same way that like incubators are quite useful in the startup world, for example, not just for financial resources, but for like advice and connections and, and this kind of thing. Um, I wonder if, if you thought about how similar kinds of services and networks could be created for smaller um, nonprofit organizations. Again, I'm going to take this uh, forward with uh, the strate strategic group. Sorry, um, we're thinking about all sorts of uh, things to explore. So I'm going to take that on board. I've also noted uh, noted you down. Would love to chat more to you about that. But some really great ideas. Thank you so much for coming. I'm I'm going to have to jump off this call because I have to uh, chair another session right next door to this. Um, but I would. I would really uh, like to thank you all for coming. It's really been, it just feels much too short a time to talk about this. I'd love to talk more about it. Do get in touch with us um, at info at scos.org or reach out to any of the colleagues you've, you've heard something from today. Would love to continue that conversation and explore different uh, business models with you and look at how the community can help fund open science infrastructure uh, with your help. So thank you very, very much, everybody. Um, and let's stay in touch. Thank you. Bye, thank you all. Thanks everyone. Bye.